Welcome to ECE 376, lecture number two, Pick Assembler. Now, a little bit of background on programming. The first computer programs were written in binary or machine code. Here, what you do is you'd have eight switches in the front and you flip them, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero. That's the first instruction and log it in. Next instruction would be zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero. That's machine code for the next instruction, log it in and so on. So your program would look like this bunch of binary numbers. That is how the machine actually works. Each instruction has its uh, binary equivalent, and this tells it what to do. The problem with this type of code, it's very hard to debug, very hard to figure out what the program does. Uh, but that's how computers work. That was the first programs. In the 1950s, Assembler was introduced. Um, what Assembler does is it takes that machine code and gives it a monomic, or a semi-English name that's much easier. For example, I might say, here's a move command in the back of the instruction manual for the PIC processor. There's the list of assembler commands. For example, one of them is MOVWF. What that does is that moves data uh, from W to a location. Um, it gets, the nice thing about assembler is it's a direct match to machine code, so it compiles very efficiently. However, assembler is really, really cryptic. So because of that, higher level languages were invented. Uh, Fortran is invented in the 1950s by IBM. C was invented in 1972 in Bell Labs. Python in 1991. And there's hundreds of other languages. Anytime you have a higher level language, what happens is you have to compile, then download. What the compiler does, it converts the code into assembler, then assembler into machine code. What that does is that increases the, or makes the code much, much easier to use. And higher level languages, you've got things like multiply, loops, for statements. And machine code, you may not have those. Uh, what you really do is you're trading off programmer time versus computer time, you know, which is worth more. Is your time worth more, or is computer time worth more? Typically, what you want uh, nowadays is a program which is easy to write, easy to understand, easy to maintain. That's the higher level languages. But eventually, it's got to get compiled into assembler. Every time you go up a level, say from assembler to C, from C to ADA, uh, to Lisp, higher level languages, every time you go up in uh, convenience, the code size typically increases 3 to 10 times which means the code runs three to 10 times slower. But in return, you wind up with code which is understandable and maintainable. A couple of reasons you would want to use assembler anyway. Assembler is the closest thing there is to machine code. It's how computers actually operate. So to understand a computer, you look at the assembler listing. Anytime you write a C code or any other language, it gets converted to assembler. So if I want to see what's happening, I go in the assembler listing and see this is what the compiler wants to do. That's how the compiler interpreted the code. Sometimes compilers make mistakes. Um, assembler is nice because it gives you direct access to the hardware. It's extremely powerful. I can do anything I want in assembler. It's extremely fast, extremely efficient. For example, the flight controller for an F-16 fighter is written in an assembler. And as a result, it's only 16K. The problem with assembler is it's very hard to write. It's very cryptic. And it's what I call throwaway code. If you take somebody else's assembler, usually the easiest thing to do is pitch it and start over. So that's why it's called throwaway code. In industry, uh, maintainability, re, uh, reusability, testability is all important. So typically, you avoid assembler if at all possible. Sometimes it's not possible. If I really need fast, efficient code, then I'll just bear down and actually write an assembler. Uh, so likewise, in this class, we're going to start out in assembler. After week four, we'll switch over to C. And what you'll see is C is a whole lot more powerful. I can do things in C like multiply, you know, stuff like that. Stuff which is very hard in assembler is easy in C. That's why we have higher level languages. But when you do that, your code is going to get three to ten times larger in size. Sometimes you can't afford that. So it's kind of starting out in assembler. Also, a little bit of background on the PIC processor. There's two types of uh, instruction sets, there's complex instruction set computing, CISC, and reduced instruction set. Uh, 
complex instruction set computing would be things like the Intel chip, where there's hundreds of commands. The nice thing about that is anything you want to do, there's probably a command for it. For example, floating point arctangent is an instruction in the Pentium chip. The idea with that is it's extremely fast. Anything you want to do probably has an instruction that corresponds to it. The problem with complex instruction set computing is it makes the processor much more comp complicated, meaning it uses more energy, costs more, uses more real estate. It'll be slower because when you clock it, it'll be the worst case instruction is how I have to clock it. And you're also using a large number of instructions that never, nobody ever actually uses. The counter to that is reduced instruction set computing. That's actually where the pick is. The idea here is that you're only actually going to use a couple instructions when you program. So why not throw away all the instructions that you never use, only include the instructions that you actually do use, and optimize the, the processor for those few instructions? The net result is a smaller, less energy um, consuming processor, faster microprocessor. Uh, so again, it's kind of an open debate, which is better? We're using a RISC architecture. Intel uses a complex instru instruction set computing on the Pentium chip. From uh, our standpoint, since we're using a PIC, it actually uses a reduced instruction set computing set. That's nice because there's only 75 instructions to learn. Actually, the previous PIC processor, the 16F2620, only had 39 instructions. They've increased it to 75 in this processor. Uh, so that's nice, only 75 instructions to learn. The downside is sometimes you have to use convoluted logic to do anything. For example, divide is not an instruction with this processor. So if you want to divide numbers, it's kind of convoluted. You can do it, but it might take quite a few instructions. Pretty much all the PIC processor can do is set and clear bits, read and write from memory, do logical operations like AND OR, exclusive OR. You can add, subtract, multiply by two, meaning shift left, divide by two, meaning shift right. Um, I can do an 8-bit multiply, that's a big deal. And that's pretty much it. Anything else has to be made up from those simple instructions. And from some syntax, the syntax with the pick assembler is on the very left-hand side, that's my labels. Point has like a label one, label two, you know, places where you can go to in your program. That's the first column. The operation is next. The register, say if I want to add, what do you want to add? Is it port A, port B, variable X, variable Y? And then F or W. If I do something like add port A, I want to add port A to W, where do you want to put the result? Do I want to put the result back in port A? That'd be an F. Or put the result in the W register? It's your pick. It's got to go somewhere, either back where you started or the working register. The list of assembly commands. Uh, these we'll be going through a little bit later, but I can do a read and write. This I find kind of annoying. Write is spelled M-O-V-W-F. It takes the working register and writes to port A. Read is spelled M-O-V-F. Um, I find that confusing because they're so similar, but that's just how microchips spelled read, M-O-V-F. M-O-V-F says take the contents of port A and move it to W. That's a read. I can also move from one register to another, M-O-V-F-F. -F, or move a literal, like move the number 234 into W. I can clear a port, that's clear port A. I can toggle the bits, or do the two's complement. Uh, for C, um, for I equals 1 to 10, I++ plus plus is a common C instruction, so they have increment by 1, that's the built-in instruction. I can add. Add WF is add port A to W, then put the result in port A, that's a comma F. If I make that a W, that's say add port A to W, put the result in W. So I can add, I can add with carry, I can add a literal, like add literal one, two, three. I can decrement, subtract, uh, subtract with borrow, subtract a literal, rotate left, that's times two, rotate right, divide by two. I can do bitter operations. Uh, clear bit 3 of port A, set bit 4 of port A, toggle bit 2 of port A. The reason that bit operations is these could be tied to valves or LEDs. This says turn off the LED on port A pin 3. Turn on the LED on port, o port A bit 4. And toggle 
LED number 2 on port A. You can do logical operations, logical AND, logical OR, exclusive OR. Uh, for looping, if I want to do like if i is greater than, or if x is greater than 3, that would be this compare. I would move x to w, then compare. Skip if equal. The next command will be skipped if it's equal, uh, not skipped if it is. That's how you do if statements in assembly. So I can skip if equal, skip if greater than, skip if less than. You can decrement a bit and skip if zero, skip if it's not zero, increment a byte, skip if the result is zero, skip if it's not zero. And we'll do that in a little bit for examples. Um, I can test a bit, test bit number five of port A, skip the next command if it's, if it's clear, or test bit number one of port A, skip the next command if it's set. Um, you have flow control. I can use go to statements and call. Call is different than go to. Go to says just go to this location memory. A call says save that save the next address, save the return address on the on the stack, because I'm going to hit a return statement. When I return, that'll pop the address off the stack and go to the next line of code. So call and go to go together, or call and return go together. Go to is I didn't save the return address. It no longer knows where I came from. There's also no op, do nothing, multiply, and that's pretty much it. So, for example, in assembler, everything goes through the W register. If I want to say A equals 5, that's not an instruction in this assembler, so I have to create it out of using a couple of instructions. For example, I could say move 5 to W, move W to A, and now A is 5. The C command, increment a by 5, I could do it this way. Move 5 to w, add a to w, put the result in w, now move w to a. I could also say move 5 to w, add 5 to w, or add a to w, put the result in a. This kind of shows the same function could be executed with three instructions in assembly, or two. Uh, that's kind of what the compilers do in C. If you're a good assembler programmer, I can usually do some tricks like this and reduce the number of lines of code. Um, compilers typically claim we're 80% efficient, meaning if I rewrite an assembly, it'll be 80% smaller in assembly, 20% bigger in C, and most manufacturers lie. It's usually 3 to 10 times bigger. Um, I can assign, but I want to say A equals B, that just says move B to A. Um, if statements. This is where the skip if equal command comes in. If I want to say if a is equal to b, set x equal to 10, otherwise do nothing. So to do that, I'm going to do the compare skip if equal command. To execute it, I have to first set it up. I'll first move a to w, then compare a to b. If it's equal, skip the next command. If it's not equal, I don't skip, and I'll just jump to the end. If it is equal, I skip, and I move 10 to w, move w to x. So this will actually execute if a is equal to b, x is equal to 10. Or more complicated, if a is greater than b, x is 10, else x is 12. That's an if-then-else statement. So to do that, I'll set up the if, x is, if a is greater than b. I'll first move b to w, do a compare, skip if greater than, is a greater than w, meaning is a greater than b. If so, skip. Uh, that'd be the if command. I'll move 10 to w, move w to x, and I'm done. Otherwise, I don't skip. I don't skip, it means I hit this line, I go to else. I'll move 12 to w, move w to x, then I'm done. So that's how you do an if then else. That's how you do the skip if greater than. That kind of gives you program control. Which of these do I go to? Um, I can do for i equals 1, i less than 10, i plus plus. In assembly, I first say set i equal to 1. I will then increment i, check is the result less than 10. If it's not less than 10, I skip out, otherwise keep repeating. Um, as opposed to a do loop. I'll keep on incrementing x by 1 as long as it's less than 10. So I'm going to say increment x, put the result in x. I'll check, is x less than 10? 
If it is less than 10, go back to loop. Otherwise, skip out, and I'm done. And note, there's several ways to do the same thing. Some are more efficient than others. And as I mentioned, C compilers claim that they do it the optimal way, and typically a good assembler can make the code three to 10 times smaller than a C compiler. Gotta remember, somebody had to write the C compiler, and it's hard to make a C compiler work for every possible C instruction set you can come up with. There's usually shortcuts you can do in assembler. Um, before we do a couple of sample codes, there's a thing called the status register. This is important in assembly. This keeps track of the previous commands. If the previous operation was negative, the end bit is set. If the previous instruction was zero, the Z bit is set. If there was a carry, like the answer is bigger than 255, the carry bit is set. So sometimes they have to use those to do different operations. Um, so now let's get down to our first program in assembly. Let's start out with writing the number 1, 2, 3, 4 to port A, B, C, and D. To do that, I first have to make port A, B, C, and D output. This we'll talk about in our next lecture, but there's a thing called tris A, B, and C. Zero means output, one means input. If I clear tris A, all eight bits are, are output. If I clear tris B, all eight bits are output. Output means the pick is driving these pins, so the LED is based upon the processor. If they're input, the push buttons control the pins. So I want the processor to drive them so everybody's output, that's clear, 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 clear. And this guy right here, the default on this processor is analog. Um, I don't know why, but it is. We're using uh, binary and, or digital first, the first part of this class, so we want to change the default. This changes the default on all pins to binary. So you're going to see that over and over again in our programs. Now to write the number 1, 2, 3, 4 to port A, B, C, D, I'll move 1 to W, move W to port A, move 2 to W, W to port B, 3 to W, W to port C, and so on. Everything goes through W. And a stop command, this is a stop command in assembly. I'm going to keep on going back to this line of code. It just keeps on spinning its wheel. That's basically a stop. If I download that code, which we'll cover in our next lecture, and run it, this is what you see. And notice that port A is 1, 2, 3, 4. It displays the answer in binary. I didn't have to tell it to do that. That's just how processors work. Everything's binary in the processor. And the bit pattern corresponds to binary 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, when you compile your code, you're going to create a couple different files. The list file, .lst, contains the assembler code the machine code, this is what goes on the processor, and where it's located in memory. There's a bootloader on this processor. The low 800 bytes of memory area where the bootloader is, that lets you download load your code that we'll talk about in our next lecture. Uh, your program starts at address 800. That's what this command does. It says, starting at 800, here's the program. Uh, second file is the hex file. This is the machine code. This is what the processor wants. If I download that code, I'll run, and I'll get the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 appearing on the PIC processor. Um, how you download the code, we'll cover in our next lecture. Uh, last example I want to do today is do an example of some operations, like A plus B, B minus A, A minus B, A or B. To do that, I want to say A equals 3, B equals 5. This is a compiler directive telling it that A is stored at memory location 0, B is stored at memory location number 1. This is actually for the programmer's convenience. I could just say 0 and 1. It's nice sometimes to have labels like, I'm talking about A and B. Uh, the processor has to know where you want to put them. Put them somewhere in memory. I've got any place between 0 and 3,942. I'll just pick 0 and 1. Make all pins output and binary. Now for the operations. I want to do port A is A plus B. So to first initialize A, I'll move 3 to W, move W to A, move 5 to W, W to B. So actually 3 goes to memory location 0, 5 goes to memory location number 1, where A and B are located. I'll now, to add the two together, move A to W, add B to W, put the result in W, move W to port A. And what I see in port A, port A is now 8. 5 plus 3. To do B minus A, I'll do move A to W, 
subtract w from b, put the result in w, put that answer in port b, and 5 minus 3 is 2. Now let's do the other way around. Move b to w, uh, subtract b from a, put the result in w, 3 minus 5 is minus 2. This is minus 2, that's actually 254, which is minus 2 in 2's complement notation. Again, the default is 2's complement. The processor doesn't know, it doesn't care what this number represents. Is it plus 2 or minus, or minus 2 or plus 254? It's the same bit pattern. Um, so likewise, if I ever get to negative numbers, I quickly wrap around. So this is 2, 1, 0. Minus 1 is all the bits that up. Minus 2 is all the bits except for this one lit up. The last case is OR. Move A to W, OR W with B, put the result in W, put W into port D. And 3 OR 5 is 7. Okay, that make a lot of sense, but if you look at the bit patterns, 3 is 0, 1, 1, 5 is 1, 0, 1, or is if either bit's a 1, the answer is 1. Here the first bit is 1, second bit is a 1, third bit is a 1. So 3 or 5 is 7. Again, no one else is going to understand that. In computer engineering, we actually did, that does actually kind of make sense. So that's the second lecture in Embedded Systems Pick Assembler. Our next lecture will look at how to download your code using MPLAB 8 and using flowcharts to describe your code.